Welcome to Multifamily Method, a podcast which explores the state of the multifamily real estate market and some of the backgrounds, methodologies, and words of wisdom from some of today's most successful multifamily real estate entrepreneurs nationwide. Welcome to the Multifamily Method, uh, a podcast that explores the state of the multifamily real estate through conversations with some of today's most successful multifamily entrepreneurs. Hi, I'm Jad Risha. Thanks for joining us. Today, we're going to be interviewing Ed Coble, the president and chief operating officer of DeBartolo Development. DeBartolo has, is an iconic name in the real estate industry with a legacy synonymous with success, dating back to the strip malls up in Youngstown, Ohio. Uh, DeBartolo invests and specializes in opportunistic acquisitions and market-driven ground-up development of multiple asset classes. Ed leads the company's capitalization, execution, and investment strategy. Thanks for coming, Ed. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, buddy. Good to see you. Good to see you. So let's just jump right into it. All right. We we were talking off, off camera about the crazy state of the market. Just kind of give me your synopsis on, you know, your your view of what's going on and then, you know, what DeBartolo's strategy is within this new space? You know, what we see is that uh, it's strange. There's sort of no liquidity. And un- unlike most of the other corrections I've lived through, where the banks had no liquidity, the banks actually have liquidity. Right. But, um, you know, there was a directive by the Office of the Comptroller <laughs> Currency that basically told the banks, unless you clear they don't want you making new originations. So unless those banks had some excess capacity, they're really not out there aggressively making loans. Is that why these construction lenders have sort of put That's why you see down. the lenders yeah. are pencils down and nobody's clearing because, as you well know from your side of the business, nobody's nobody's selling, right. nobody's buying, right? right. Because uh, like we we're just laughing about, you know, you're probably pricing new multi in uh, in Florida at two forty two fifty a door, given where rates are right. and things at insurance. And, you know, as a seller, you know, we're a seller of some assets and um, we're actually under contract, uh, as you might know, with a couple of assets in Florida at 310 a door. Yeah. You know, so if you were at 310 and now it's worth 250, you're like, wait a minute, what happened? Yeah. Right? yeah. So, um, you know, like us, we're, we have no particular panic. Um, as you know, I, I pray a lot. I spend a lot of time with the Lord and, and he kind of told us this was coming. So we've been building up cash and we've been very conservative with our underwriting. You know, most of our deals are in the high sixes, some some sevens and eights, right? Okay. So, and- Well, we, I know because you never looked at any of our stuff yeah, yeah, a year and a half yeah, of it. Exactly. You know, so, since we told you the price. So, so we've, got a, we've got quite a bit of margin and, and we'd kind of do what we call- midterm financing, right? So we've got long term on our construction loans with extensions that can kind of get us out there five, six years. You know, okay. it's not permanent financing, yeah. but we kind of, you know, we look at it, hey, if if the problems are still out there five, six years, we we get a whole bigger, bigger problem than than that. Um and so we've we feel pretty excited about it. Um I I think um in the multifamily space, we'll talk about macro US yeah, you got 500,000 units coming online this year. So that's a peak. We haven't had that for about 20 years. And um, so in our view of the of all the market conditions we see, we think that rents are probably going to drift down a little bit, depending on which market you're in, obviously. Sure. And uh, and I think that um, absorption is going to kind of taper off a little bit. Right. Part of that, too, is the consumer is getting hammered with inflation, right? Yeah. So if the average income, <clears throat> you know, for our our average, well, not not our luxury product, but our, our sort of middle of the line, A, B, new construction, Florida is, you know, you kind of have to have $85,000 to live in an apartment right. Right, as an income, right? Well, if you look at, you know, the government just published January inflation at 6.1%, but those inflation numbers, the government prints out do not include food and energy, right? Well, food and energy is where, <laughs> the, biggest that's where thing, the pain is, right? right? Yeah. You fill up your car, your truck, and, and you feel it, you know, gas has, has sprung back yeah. up, right? 350, 360, 370, and it, generally in Florida, it's more right. in South Florida, a little less in Central yeah. Florida. Um, and that 6.1% is stacked on top of last year's nine. That's stacked right? on last year's nine, you know? Yeah. So <clears throat> none of our wages went up 15%, right. right? So, and then if you look at, you know, food just in January, food alone was up 10 percent, 10.1 percent. Energy was up about eight. So, you know, we're concerned with 
the state of the consumer, right? right. We don't see rent growth. Um, and so what does that mean, right? That means, you know, people are going to be doubling up. That means people, some people are going to move back home if yeah. they have that capacity. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, and top of all that, you know, we've seen a ton of deals like, like you were kid, kidding, kiddingly serious a little bit ago. We missed out on a lot of deals with you because we're, we put a ton of our own cash in deals. Sure. And, um, and we see a lot of our competitors do a 95 five deal with an LP right. and they don't even write a check, right? They're contributing right. part of their fee. So, right. so they didn't yeah. even go to the bank and put in two or three million. They're just, right. Oh, I'll contribute my fee. Yeah. Well, they can, they can, it's, you know, they just throw it up. If it sticks, great. Sure. But, you know, we were, we've been talking to a lot of our competitors who were in that space and, and uh, one in particular has 18 deals in Florida. Wow. 18, that he's 95.5. He, he told me he was building those on paper before supply chain issues, everything. He had a five and a quarter. Okay. Of course, he, he self performs on construction, and right. so his his team, many of many teams, missed the whole supply chain thing through COVID, and so he's six to eight million dollars over budget on every deal. Um, he's a year late on every deal, so Jeez. you know, is he building that now to a four five four six, right? right? And if the market's five five and a quarter, you know, if if you think about it. If he's, if it's a hundred million dollar deal on average and you're 75, 80 points, base points out of the market, his, his piece is out of the money. Gone. It's gone. Right? So the LP in, in our view is impaired, right? Right. So if the LP had 25 million in the deal, maybe that 25 is worth 18 to 20. Right. Now there's a lot of LPs that'll just move him out of the way. They'll Take ride over. the market right. and then it'll, 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 it'll stabilize out right. two, three, four, five years, whatever it takes. But if they have to refinance, I mean, if they don't have a, you know, five, six year runway on their debt, yeah. they got to refinance out of a construction yeah. loan and they're bringing, they might be bringing more cash to the table. Exactly. Yeah. And most LPs, as you know how they work, they, they don't want to do that, right? Yeah, that right. completely screws up their model, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. So that's one of the products we've offered, we introduced last year is we'll offer liquidity to those LPs. Okay. If they want out. We okay. also have a, another product and that is the gap money to go. If you've got a good project that's built and stabilized or almost stabilized and you got to come off your construction loan to go to bridge or agency, you know, the typical $100 million deal, if you think about it, interest rates have now doubled, right, uh, from where they were for sure. 13 months ago. For sure. And so if you go to refinance that $100 million deal, you're if you just do the math, you're $10 million short of getting – Financed, right? Yeah, you can get financed. You're you're, you're young, ten million short, and you know the development community well. There's not a lot of developers that can stroke a ten million dollar check, and so we're in that game where we can we can we can make those kinds of investments, take a position in the deal, yeah, and help recapitalize. Opportunistic. So, so we think it's yeah. pretty interesting for yeah. us. We're pretty excited about it. It's a it's a great place to be. I think that um, right now, as you know. It's kind of a steering contest, right? You, you tell <laughs> somebody right. the, their deal's worth 240, they think it's worth 310. They're like staring at you, you're staring at them. Like, and until there's pressure when that loan comes due, right? right? Either their LP loan comes due or their senior comes due, they don't really have to do anything. Right. I think in the third and fourth quarter, there's going to be a tsunami of transactional activity at your end of the business and our end I, of the I business. I agree. I agree. And I think it's coming. I think it's coming in, in the development space when these construction loans term out. I think it's coming in the value add space. When uh, rate caps expire and, and you know, when rate caps expire and they get hit with an insurance renewal yeah. around the same time, I mean, their cash, you know, a lot of people's cash flow is going to go to zero, especially if they bought, you know, a four cap in Gainesville, you know, 70s. We, we had Gainesville. an institutional investor bring us a deal to get a second opinion on. They sure. didn't like the opinion their broker gave them. Sure. And they paid, they paid 170 for a low B product in a, in a market we'd all like to be in. Sure. And <clears throat> amazingly, the broker brought them an offer about 15 months ago where they could make 100 a door on a flip. And they hadn't done anything to building. And they said, no, we want to make more. Well, now oh. they're 100 the other way. They're 100 below their cost because of the interest rate cap, um, the rate of uh, the uh, – yeah. uh, 
rents have gone down a little bit, but the big killer was in, uh, insurance. Yeah. And so I think we're going to see a tremendous in that product, sort of pre-95 product, uh, apartment product. I think there's going to be a lot of carnage there. Yeah, I think so, too. I mean, you're, if you bought a, you know, if you got a, a three and a half floater, right, four, three and a half, four with a with a 200 basis point rate cap, basically, and that goes away, you're at eight. Yeah. I mean, so your debt service is is more than double, basically. And then your insurance is more than double. Um I mean, you had to grow the rents probably forty percent to, yeah, to right. absorb that, right? Yeah, yeah, and and of course you can't. But it's you know, so I think that there's going to be. I mean, for your side of the business, there's going to be a tremendous amount of transactional volume. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I think for our business, you know, hey, if if we could buy, you know. 10,000 units that we don't have to build. We think sure. that's pretty interesting. Yeah. So, <laughs> we, Well, we've started to have those conversations. I mean, we had a, a, a client come to us and he has a deal and, you know, kind of late 90s, early 2000s deal. And he's got three choices. Is put, you know, uh, b- buy a rate cap extension, put more money into the deal or s- sell it at a loss. Well, he's, you know, fortunately for him, has the ability to do either one or two. A lot of guys don't. That's right. You know. Well, the fascinating thing is so many funds, and, and you, you deal with a lot of them, bought that kind of product, right? And, and the, the funds are interesting beast because they usually don't put money in to chase a deal, right? right. So if it goes bad, they usually hit the reject button and they yep. just, hey, Jad, sell it for us, right? Whatever yep. the pain is, the pain right. is, right? Um, so I think you're going to see a lot of institutional guys. I think you'll see some of the yeah. wealthier individuals, private individuals, they'll, they'll save their asset. Sure. For, for and the fund is, you know, as long as the fund level returns are, I mean, if, if they've got, a, you know, some up, out, assets that are outperforming expectation, yeah. they, they can, can just the they can just rip off a, a, a you know, a bad That's deal right. and, and just move on. You know, so, if you're raising deal by deal. Oh, you're dead. Yeah. You're dead. Yeah. And a lot of these syndicators who were raising, you know, from, you know, non-accredited yeah. investors, which was happening a lot, that they're going to be in, in a lot of trouble. It's going to be, I think we're going to have a lot of fun over the next two years. So, yeah, <laughs> we're going to be busy. We're going to be busy. Yeah, it was it was probably slow for about six months, but we're starting to get busy again, which which is good. I mean, you know, you can only go go play golf or do whatever. So, so, so much without right. getting bored. Um, so you've seen a few of these. I think a good, this is a good place to sort of step back and just kind of let you tell, tell us how you got into the business and sort of how you got to where you are today. Uh, thanks. Uh, so I really got in the, the real estate business uh, when I was six years old. So um, my uh, my mom, uh, my, my grandparents came over from Switzerland as tenant farmers. So they had uh, they worked a 300 acre farm northwest Pennsylvania, which is not a very fertile place. So it was kind of a crappy place to right. land, but that's where they right. end up. <laughs> so there was a wealthy landowner that owned it and they got to keep 10% of what they raised. So they had a lot of free labor, had nine kids. My mom, obviously one of them. And it was literally slave labor. My grandparents were really tough because it was a hard scrabble existence. Yeah. And uh, my mom wanted to get off the farm. And so she ended up <clears throat> getting a job with a doctor where she had a, a medical appointment, a couple of medical appointments. And she convinced the doctor and his wife to hire her, she'd clean house and cook uh, when she was in ninth grade with the promise that when she graduated that uh, they put her through nursing school. So she thought she had a ticket out of this poverty. Um, Unfortunately, the doctor got cancer, died in her senior year. The wife wouldn't honor the agreement. So my mom moves to Pittsburgh, which happened to be the biggest town around. And uh, mom, Marilyn Monroe, beautiful. And uh, she got a job as a hostess in a, in a, in a restaurant in uh, Pittsburgh. And that's where she met my dad. So my dad sweeps her off her feet. Um, and he, uh, takes her to New York Plaza hotel. That's where I'm conceived. (laughs) Buys her a brand new Cadillac. You know, they literally, um, go to Las Vegas. He's friends with Sinatra and, and, uh, Martin and uh, they're having dinner. Like, so farm girl. Yeah. Boom. Her her head's exploding. Right. Um, I come along Dad hangs around. Now, they don't get married, right? <clears throat> and so um, dad comes along and um, hangs out. And then when I'm about six, he disappears from the scene. Well, 
you know, he had promised my mom that he would get a divorce and then come and marry her and we'd live happily ever after. Right. Happily ever after did not materialize. And so uh, my mom had a broken heart. And to feel that pain, uh, to solve that pain, just started drinking. And then when that wasn't enough, she started taking some drugs. So we ended up living in a tough part of town. This is going on in Pittsburgh. And um, so we moved from one place to another. We end up in an old Victorian home where a developer is buying these old, where Andrew Carnegie and all these wealthy guys, yeah, are, yeah all these old mansions. But that was the hood, right? Yeah. Um, and so he'd buy these big four-story mansions and he'd break them up into one, two room of little apartments. So we have a little apartment there. And uh, he'd come looking for the rent. And he, looking back, he had to be, a, be an angel or be a, a Christian. And, and um, you know, my mom would be, you know, strung out. <clears throat> and uh, so as when you're six, like you don't understand, you can't process yeah. this. So it's like, hey, my mom's sleeping, you know, your own defense mechanisms. And so, but this guy, he had so much wisdom. He'd take me by the hand and say, hey, come and do chores. And, you know, when you're six, you don't do anything. You make a mess, you know. Right. <laughs> you're not accretive to the problem. Yeah. Right? You're making right. a problem. And so, but he would pay, the rent was like $35, $40, right? right? So he would pay me. So I think that the early time it was, the rent was 35. So he'd give me 50 bucks. So he'd say, okay. pay me back. Now I think about that. What did that do? That gave me dignity. Yeah. Now, I didn't understand that. It's six years old. But right looking back, like, and then I had extra money so I could buy food. Right. So, so that was super amazing. Right. But the really cool part for you and I, from the real estate point of view, right. I can still see it in my mind's eye. He would do these performers. No, they weren't very fancy, right? There were one right. little one pagers. Right. So literally this building we lived in, he paid $4,200 for, Wow. you know, so now we're like 19, 62, right? right. Put it in perspective, right? right? And so, and then he'd say, oh, you're paying $35. Mr. Jet, he's got that nice three bedroom place overlooking the park. He's paying 75, right? right? So he'd show me all the tenants' names, the rent they're paying, the expenses and the profit. Oh, so at six years old, he was so, teaching yeah. you stuff. So he's trying to teach me, you know. That's really cool. Because we hung out a lot because I was kind of a street urchin, you know? Yeah. Um, and it was a scary building because there were, you know, lots of drug dealers, uh, prostitutes. My, all my early babysitters were prostitutes. And, uh, wow. It was an, it's crazy. Wild. It's amazing. I'm, I'm, yeah. here, I'm yeah. here with you guys today. <clears throat> so he would kind of let me hang out and he said, well, I'll teach him. I'll teach him math. I'll teach you real estate. So, okay. Like, right. So that is in my noggin, right? I'm like, this is amazing. Now at that point, I wasn't thinking I'm going to be in real estate. <clears throat> Fast forward a little bit. Vietnam war is going on. I'm in um, Pittsburgh, kind of blue collar town. And <clears throat> at that time it was politically correct. They take all the, all the boys You'd go to the auditorium in high school and there'd be literally Army, Marine Corps, Navy, Air Force. Blah, blah. They would come in and do five or 10 minute presentations. Hey, come join the Army. Go to Vietnam. Kill the bad guys. Sure. It'll be great, right? <laughs> you think sure. about that yeah. now, right? Yeah. <laughs> so what are you? I mean, you're probably 17, 18 so I'm, years yeah, old so at I'm this time. 16. So it, it's yeah. going, they're doing it twice a year because yeah. you know, we're at the peak of the war. They need, they need, they bodies, need bodies, right? Yeah. And uh, – and so, you know, um, I figure, and, and the pitch was good, right? At the time, the military would pay if you wanted to get a doctorate, a PhD, they pay for it, right? All the way through. All the way through. Now, I wasn't, I wasn't a good student, sure. so I was, I was enamored with that, but I was like, not thinking, oh, I'm going to go get my PhD because I right. said, well, free college. I'm like free college. That's, yeah. Because most of, at that point, no one in my family had ever been to college. So that was like, okay, oh. College, but are you consciously looking at like this is a way to get out of this? Oh, yeah. So I'm looking at it like I'm looking at hey, it's it's a job, it's a skill, it's a way out, and I'll get free college. Um, you know, when you're young and you think about going to war, like you don't think you're gonna get hurt, right? Yeah, bulletproof at 17, 16, 17, 18. And the landlord in that building we lived in, the basement was full of rats. And so when I was 12-ish, I think it was 12, he bought me a pellet gun <laughs> and he said he couldn't get rid of these rats. So he said, hey, every rat you kill, I'll give you a dollar. Are you kidding me? Like a dollar was like real money. Yeah. 
So there were many months I killed a hundred rats. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and I had some, I had some jingle, right? So I had more money in, you know, going through school than any of my friends, did, you know? And so, um, so I thought after hearing the pitch, Hey, I'll go in the military. I'll be a sniper. Like I'm shooting from here to the wall, like, yeah, right. like 30 feet. Right. So, yeah. but I'll be a sniper. Right. Um, so this is, this is a funny story. So, um, so I hear the pitch and, and, uh, my buddies say, Hey, we're going in the army. It was one kid, one of the Marines. And I said, I'm, I'm going to join the army. So I couldn't go down with those guys. So I went uh, another weekend downtown to the recruiting office, but I get off the bus. I'd never really been downtown Pittsburgh. So I, I don't know really what I was doing. I see a guy down, uh, down the street in a military uniform. I figure this must be the place. Follow him. He gets in the elevator. I get in the elevator. He goes, where are you going? I said, the recruiting office. He goes, two buildings down the street. Elevator goes up, opens the door. He walks out. He says, hey, come here. Okay. You know, you're dope yeah. kid, right? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> he goes, um, what do you want to do? I tell him a little bit of what I just told you guys. He says, hey, yeah, you speak languages. Yeah, I had some language. And my, my parents, my grandparents spoke, uh, spoke German. I had a little German. And uh, he says, come in. And so he said, hey, let me give you a test. What do I know? Right? Yes. Yeah. Said, okay. Hey, can you come back next Saturday? Take this. Yeah. Boom, boom, boom. Now all my friends go down day one, sign up. They're in. Like, right. Um, so they're making fun of me. Like, Hey, you must be really stupid. You can't, like, <laughs> you can't get in the army in Vietnam. Right. And so, um, I took a lot of ribbing, but anyway, I, I did this for weeks on end. And uh, finally this guy, this Colonel says, Hey, um, do you, how about this? I'd like to offer you something different than being a sniper. He said, um, why don't you be a counterintelligence agent? Now I'm in 10th grade, right? Uh, in in uh, the 70, what is it, 72? I have no idea what that is. So yeah. I said, I, I don't know what the heck that is. He says, well, have you ever seen James Bond movie? Yeah, I saw, I saw one of those, you know. He goes, uh, I said, so I'd be that guy, like that guy? He goes, not really, but you do some spy stuff. And uh, I said, okay. So I trusted this guy. So I enter into a delayed entry contract to go into counterintelligence. So basically, um, now I wasn't going to graduate for two more years, which is what they want. They, they want you to graduate. They don't want to yank you out of high school. Yeah. And so high school graduation, go to basic training. Then I go to this crazy place called spy school. So down in Fort Watch, you go to the Arizona, Mexico border. And, um, they teach you how to do espionage stuff. And, uh, so had, had a great time learned, uh, learned the trade. Um, when I graduated, uh, it, it started that journey. The Vietnam war had just ended three months before. So fortunately you, missed, you weren't needed or wasn't right. there. Yeah. And, and so, but the cold war was raging. Yeah. And so now we were spying on the Russians and the East Germans, right? Germany was right. divided. Right? right. I tell some young people that they're like, what are yeah, you talking right? about? Yeah. Like, yeah. There was two different countries right down the middle. And so, um, so we were spying on, on those guys. So I had a great, great time in the military. Uh, it was time to re-enlist. I got an appointment to go to West Point, but my mom was still struggling. And, and if you go to a military academy, first two years, you don't get to leave much. It's pretty tough. Yeah. So um, I said no to that. A colonel that I served with was retiring and he bought a little real estate company. Our last assignment was in Colorado Springs. And so... Um, I said, uh, he said, Hey, why don't you, um, so I had decided to go to the university of Colorado, um, at, at night and work a real estate job with him. So he said, Hey, get your real estate license and then you'll do real estate. Well, I'm 21 years old. Yeah. Um, nobody wants to buy a house from you because you're dope. You don't sure. know anything. Right? right. So horrible failure at that. So I go into the colonel and I tell him, Hey, I'm going to quit this real estate job. Plus I didn't know it was a commission job, right? right. There was no salary. <laughs> right. So I'm like, this really stinks, right? I, 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 I'm making no money. So I tell the Colonel, Hey, next semester, I got this great bartending job. A buddy of mine owns a bar. I'm going to go to school during the day. See you later. And he gets mad at me and he says, you know, you're not using any of the resources that we taught you. Uh, we, t you know, we taught you to improvise, to adjust, you know, you gotta, you gotta work on the fly, right? Because you're using your benefits, your military benefits to go to school for free, but you could buy an apartment building up, up to a four unit apartment building with no money down. Well, now that connects with my six year old story. Yeah. I'm like, no way. 
And he says, you're a terrible salesman, so you should be a real estate investor. Now, I had no money, so <laughs> right. like, okay, I don't know how yeah, a real you're estate like, investor, yeah, but- Invest what? But yeah, so he goes, no. I'll, so he actually showed me how to do this. So I bought, first property I bought was a four-unit apartment building by the military base. It was vacant, beat up. And uh, I'm not very handy, but I got some buddies and, and a couple of weekends, we fixed it up and it rented right away. I go back to the colonel. It's a colonel. It's leased up. I got positive cash flow. Um, what should I do? He goes, well, you're still broke, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm really broke now because any money I had, my credit cards were maxed out. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm tight. Um, he said, well, why don't you sell it? Okay. How do I do that? He goes, run an ad in the Los Angeles Times. Because in the 70s, real estate in California was going up 25% a year. Right. Everybody was sort of a paper millionaire and buying all the real estate they could bid. So I ran this little ad, a classified ad in the Los Angeles Times. Never forget, back then it cost me 300 bucks, which was a, a lot, lot of money. Of money yeah. right? That was a lot of money. And I ended up getting hundreds of calls off that silly little thing. And you'll love this. You know, we have all this technology now. So I had one of those little metal boxes with A to Z in it. So, you know, if you called in, I'd write down your name. You'd go under R. Yeah. <laughs> that was my, my yeah, you're building a database. That's my database, yeah, right? That's right. And so um, I ended up selling this thing from the day I bought it till I sold it. It was about 120 days. And when I sold it, I made 37500 bucks, which was a lot of money. Right. You know, and uh, another funny story on that is I, I, as broke as I was, I carried the check around and uh, I was friends with the, um, the dean of the business school at Colorado. And I had become really close and uh, he knew what I was doing. And I went to see him. We were, we went out for a lunch and I pulled this check out. I go, I, I sold it. He goes, how much you make? I hand him the check. He looks at it. He goes, are you kidding me? He made $18,000 a year at the time. So you think about that. I just made double <laughs> one deal that he made, right? And he said, what are you going to do now? I said, I'm going to keep doing it, right? Yeah. So I did that 81 more times in the next two years. Wow. Buying crappy properties, nobody down. So um, banks were lending hundred percent. Banks were, banks were lending. Actually, they weren't. Uh, uh, funny thing is, you'll, you'll love this where we are in the economy. Prime rate was 18%. Jeez. So you think about buying a piece of real estate, 18%. Yeah. So the math, this is going to sound strange, is not very different from today, right? So if, if just like you said, you know, if, if a property was worth today, you know, last year, 310 a door, and sure. now interest rates are seven, eight percent. Now it's worth 240, 250. Right. The same when they go to 18, right. you know, that little fourplex was not worth 200. Now it's worth a hundred, right? right? So you're buying low, right? Right. Because the interest rates. And, um, and so did a lot of seller financing, did lots of creative things. Um, meet my wife at the time. She ran a title company. So I was in and out of there and uh, we ended up getting married. And then um, I just started networking, you know, um, cocktail parties and just, you know, the title companies would hold a party. And yeah, you just, had a little money now. A little too, money so now. So yeah. now, now I'm meeting people and they're, and now I'm exposed to development. I'm like, wow. Cause I had slum property. Sure. Right? And, um, and so I said, uh, I think I want to be a developer at the time. The only school that had a four year program to get a, a degree in real estate development was the university of Southern California. Um, and so I thought about that, but um, I went back to my, the colonel, my friend, and he said, you know, what we do in the military is on the job training. He said, it's, you, you'd be better off to really work with a developer and learn the business. So I was at this cocktail party and the top developer in town is there. And uh, I go to him and I introduce myself. I said, look, I'm a young real estate guy. You're like the guy. Look, would you mentor me? He goes, I'd love to. He gives me his card. He says, show up at my head, my headquarters. You know where it is? Yeah, I know where it is. And to be there at seven o'clock Monday. I, I, I held that card like a lottery ticket. Like, this <laughs> is my ticket. I'm going to get filthy rich. And I was all about money. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, I'm going to get filthy rich. I show up Monday, fancy office, big boardroom. I'm like the last guy. <clears throat> I'm on time, seven o'clock. I'm like 6.55, but like it's already full. I, want, I see these guys. There's, he's at the main head of the table and these like 10 other guys around the table. And in front of them are these books. Some have black leather, some red leather. I'm like, it's weird. 
I go in there. It's a Bible study. Oh. It's a Bible study. I'm like, that son of a gun tricked me. Like, I had not really been to church. I didn't really, yeah. I didn't grow up in church. And um, so he has me sit next to him. He has a Bible for me. He gives me my first Bible. And these guys just walk through. I didn't know anything. Like, you know, they say, hey, turn to Genesis. I'm like, well, I don't want that. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about? So they put the little tabs in. Ever seen those? Where, like yeah. big tabs so you can like find stuff, you know? So like, oh, so they next week they tabbed it. So I wasn't a complete dope, you know? And so, but they never embarrassed me. So these guys just poured into me. Um <clears throat> And then they would take me to these luncheons, Christian businessmen's luncheon every every month where somebody would share what they call their testimony, you know, their life before Christ, how they met Christ and what happened later, and then give an invitation for people if they wanted to receive Jesus Christ. So they would take me to these luncheons hoping that I would pray to receive Christ. But, <clears throat> you know, I had a lot of bad habits from the military. Swore, smoked, drove too fast, drank too much, you know, right. all, I was that guy. <clears throat> and so... I was like, well, you know, do I have to give all that up to be a Christian? Yeah, so I'm wrestling with that in my head. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and um, But these guys loved on me. And they just kept taking me to these lunches. This goes on for six months. And they, this guy was like the big guy in town. So like they'd always get the table like in front of the speaker, hoping that being close to the speaker would rub off on me. You right, know? right. <laughs> and so um, six months into it, they have a speaker, a guy named Carl Combs. He literally, rocket scientist, lead guy to put man on the moon. So after he did that, he said, I'm just going to tell people about Jesus the rest of my life. So he traveled around the world several times telling people. So he happened to be the guy that day. And he tells a story. And uh, I said, I'm at that table bawling like a baby, prayed to receive Christ. And so that started my Christian walk, my Christian journey, which, um, you know, we could go into further, but... I, I keep talking. You want to ask some more questions? Yeah, well, no, I'm just, we're, we're, um, I mean, just trying to give – yeah. so we get through that, and now how do we end up where we're at today, yeah. just running to Bartolo? You know, so, um, you know, kind of fast forward through through uh, those middle years, um, my wife and I, you know, started – we went from uh, doing sort of can, um, these small crappy properties to a little bit bigger properties, a little bit bigger, and then um, we had an amazing run. I mean, we made uh, my wife and I tens of millions of dollars doing apartment building, shopping centers to the moon. Um, but there were a lot of a lot of lessons I would say that I wasn't getting as I went through the Bible and I grew in my in my walk with Christ. You know, maybe some things I skipped over, shortcuts, those kinds of things right. when you're immature, right? Right. And so, you know, the Lord has a way of correcting it. So there was a a correction back in the eighties, there was an SNL crisis. Yeah. And so real estate got devalued like 70, 80%. And my wife and I, we, we, as it started to unfold, you know, it took a couple of years for that to unfold. All the money we were making, we were paying off loans and trying to stay above water. <laughs> and so, um, you know, we're selling off fancy cars. I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're augering it. <clears throat> when the music stops, she and I are on a $106 million loan, big shopping center I built. Now, Interesting. You're, you're doing this for a bigger group or is no. this just your, this is your shop? So now? my wife and I are signing loan guarantees. Wow. You know, okay. that's how it worked back yeah. then, you know? So we're personal guarantees, $106 million loan. The bank fall uh, craters, the government takes it over and they're like, hey, we want our money. We're calling the loan. Like, I had just spent every money, all the money I'd made that I had spent like solving the other problems. Got all that resolved. $106 million loan. I am out of gas. And so um, our, our lawyers and accountants say, hey, you know, you're young. I mean, we're like 31, 32, like we're, we're young. Right. And they said, hey, why don't you f just file bankruptcy? Everybody's doing it. All developers are doing it. No big deal. And just, you know, that'll wipe the slate clean. And, you know, you could, you know, you'll be out of real estate, go do something else. My wife and I pray about it. And we hear from the Lord. Don't do it. Pay it off. Like, okay, so pay it off, but he didn't tell us how. Right. Like, okay. And you don't have 106 <laughs> sitting in the bank. I have it, right? Yeah. <clears throat> um, so we said, well, we don't want to be disobedient to God. Like, I guess, I guess he'll show us how to do it. We don't have enough time, but five years it took to pay that off. We didn't file bankruptcy. We get through that very tough time. Like, I'm selling real estate. I'm like, whatever it takes yeah. to like 
put groceries on the table, yeah. right? I'm, I'm doing it. Like I'm washing cars. I mean, whatever. So go from getting a new Mercedes every year, bigger, fancier vacations, right? You know, $5,000 Brioni suits, you know, just all that to that, right? Right. A little humble pie. Yeah, Lord had to humble me a little bit. And so <clears throat> five years of that, we finally get it all paid off without, without bankruptcy. The Lord just navigated yep. literally day by day. <clears throat> and then we get through that. And uh, like, I'm like, wow, man, I'm, you know, I'm selling houses and fourplexes and little crap. You get stuff. through that and you're just like, you're toast, you're spent, right? right? Yeah. You're just spent. And so my wife then says. Just to get back to Eve. Something, something yeah. amazing. He goes like, if you're going to stay in real estate, I really, I really don't want you to sign these loans personally. Like, I, I don't want to do that. But yeah. I was like, too hard. We had two young special needs kids, like way too hard. Right. I said, okay. Then the next day, I try to start every day with the Lord, you know, praying and yeah. journaling and listening. So I'm talking to the Lord. I'm like, Lord, like, not that I had anything. Like I was probably negative net worth at right. the time. But uh, I'm like, wow, how, how am I going to do that, Lord? In a nanosecond, he gives me a business plan. I write it down. And part of the business plan was go to Wall Street, raise $500 million plus a plus a, an elaborate plan. Right. Now, I have no assets and probably a negative net worth. Right. I, but a track record. Had a track record. Yeah, good right. point. Good point. I, I, had, I didn't finish college. I dropped out because I was making so much money. I said, sure. oh, who needs yeah, this? Yeah, who needs and it? Even the dean said, who needs this? Yeah. Right. Go, That's go right. Yeah. And so um, I'd never been to New York, never been to Wall Street. No pedigree, didn't know anybody. Right. So I take this business plan. I produce 10 binders with the plan in it. Go to Wall Street literally on a Sunday. Monday, I'm cold call. Goldman, Barclays, all the, sure, yeah. all the guys you know. And I said, hey, can you put me in touch with somebody at the real estate desk? Yeah, sure. Here's Jeff. So I meet these people. At the end of the week, I get $500 million. That's unbelievable. It's crazy, right? Oh yeah. my God. And if you think about it, if God gives you something to do, he'll resource you to do it, right? That's right. what's so cool about right. walking with God, right? Yeah. And so <clears throat> now I didn't get the money that Friday. I got the term sheet and it took a, took a month to close it, but literally yeah. in a week got it. And so- um, the, And how did you pitch him? The pitch was, I'm going to open offices from Los Angeles to Miami, and I'm going to find the number two developer at a good shop, and we're going to bank him. And we're going to take all those deals and uh, we're going to build and sell them to the REIT. Because at that time, the REITs were really taken off and right. they needed product. Right. Like there wasn't enough product. And so they needed product. So we knew we had a ready audience to buy. So we we're doing apartments and retail. Ready audience to buy that stuff. Right. So before you know, we're finishing them and they're closed, they're, the REITs are buying them. And we're making crazy money. And I didn't have to sign on the money. Beautiful. Right. Which is standard now, Which right? Standard I mean, now. Yeah. yeah, back then, it was, yeah. that was all starting out. Yeah. And so that took off. And then, um, kind of get to, to the question you asked. So <clears throat> that we did that for a couple of years, and then I was raising a billion dollars. And my mother had died. She came to know Christ at the end of her life. My father had died. And I wanted to reach out. I knew I had a half-brother and half-sister. And I reached out. Um, to get closure in my, my half brothers, Eddie DeBarlo. Yeah. And so um, Eddie had moved to Tampa from San Francisco after winning five Super Bowls. And he's very, very successful in the sports world. And um, so we met here in town at Shulis. Uh, I had an office. Yeah. Here. At, I, at the, yeah. yeah. So I had sure. an office uh, and, uh, over in uh, Pinellas and I had one in Miami here in Florida. Um, and so I, I sent him a letter. We talked on the phone. So you were already here. No. Well, I had an office here, okay. but I hadn't met Eddie. Okay. And so I, I just, I don't know why I sent a letter, said, Hey, we should meet. So we end up meeting, um, at Shula's we have dinner and we're both like awkward, like at, yeah. you know, five well, Super Bowls, yeah. all the NFC championships he won. Yeah. Like he said, man, this is like the scariest meeting I've ever had. Right. Know? And so we kind of met, it was a little awkward and we hit it off. And then we hung out, uh, for a couple of years with our family. He has three daughters. I have two. And we just, uh, fell in love. And then, um, we ended up, just saying, hey, let's do a little partnership, right? With no particular agenda. Sure. And so my family and I moved from Paradise Valley, Arizona to Tampa almost 20 years ago. Okay. This little thing. And it wasn't, there was a sort of no, 
no plan. It wasn't like, hey, we want to get big. Or we weren't even a multifamily that. We we're really doing retail. Yeah. In the beginning. And, um, but he's very, very kind. And, um, you know, he got the sports gene, you know, he's a sports yeah. genius. And, right. um, um, <clears throat> so we've, we've had a great run, you know, we've done 40, over 45,000 apartments and billions of feet of retail and other things. So that's how we got together. So, I mean, so you think about it, even God can even fix a family that's broken apart Yeah, and in your forties and for him his fifties, put it back together yeah. in love. You know, you think about the power of walking with God. Multifamily Method is powered by Capstone Companies, the largest privately owned multifamily investment sales brokerage nationwide. Capstone Companies provides dedicated coverage to both primary and secondary markets throughout the Southeast, Mid-Atlantic, and Midwest regions of the United States. Whether buying, selling, or refinancing, Capstone Companies is here to help. Simply put, Capstone is expertise, experience, extra mile. If you're interested in having Capstone provide a complimentary opinion of value on your multifamily asset, please visit us at capstone-companies.com. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. That story, I've heard some variation of that story in the past. I'm I'm glad you uh, shared it here because um, it's so unique and interesting and just, um, you know, fortuitous how your worlds came together to, to do this. And now you've been, you know, incredibly successful together. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, but he's not, tip, he's not involved on a really a daily, not a daily basis. Yeah. We met yesterday and kind of went yeah. through some things. Yeah. He's not involved on a daily basis. But, yeah. You know, he's got a lot of, of, uh, things that he oversees, you know, with all the wealth and their sure. interest in science. And what's the age difference? Uh, he's 11 years old. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. We're having a lot of fun. Yeah, no, it's great. It's great. And you, I mean, the, look, the brand speaks for itself and you've done a lot of great work over the last 10 years. You were, you've probably done less than you could have in the last five or six years, right? I mean, I remember spe- seeing you speak, I don't know, five or six years ago and you were, um, you were, you were bearish on multifamily yeah, early, uh, early, earlier than a lot of other yeah, people yeah. were. That's right. <laughs> and probably missed some opportunity, yeah. but, uh, well, we in, but in retrospect, yeah are in a good place for it, yeah, right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, we did. I mean, a lot of the stuff downtown, like we're like, that'll never work at $3 rent. Yeah, right, know, yeah. Right? I think it was like uh, 2015, 16 over at the a la carte pavilion, if you remember right. speaking at that yeah. thing, yeah. Yeah, that was, yeah, we, we missed we missed, a, we missed a bit yeah. of the market there for sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, talk to me about, I guess, some of the more more fun projects you've done since mm-hmm. since you got together with Eddie at DeBartolo. And, and, you know, if there's one in particular, maybe... Maybe like the most fun you one you've done, and then maybe like the most challenging one that you've had to execute. Yeah. So I'll give you three. So you know, a fun one was in the last crash, we got a call from a life company and uh, off market deal, and they said, "Hey, we've got this this building. It's had rapes, murders, knifings, gunfights. It's bad. It's in Orlando. Do you want it?" I'm like, "Well, give me the address so on my computer. Right. It is literally next to Disney." So I'm like, great piece of real estate, yeah. but it is rough shape. It just came off light tech. And okay. so, you know, it was a bad shape. Uh, you'll love this. So three-story walk up and on, on the second and third floors, they took a piece of plywood and nailed it from the outside into the wall. So you couldn't open the door to go out on the, on the balcony oh because they were rotten and you'd fall through. I mean, give you the picture of it. Yeah. So it was bad. So um, I literally, I told the, the institution, they wanted 8 million bucks for it. 350, 360 units. Yeah. I said, we'll, we'll take it. Like, yeah. Just, yeah, done. Uh, right. It's just worth it. Right. Yeah. And uh, we bought it, you know, for like 25 a door and we, uh, we put 25 a door in it. And I think back then we sold it for like 170 or something. Right. Like crazy money. It's probably like 2012, 13, yeah, 12, something like 13, that. Yeah. yeah. So huge home run. Yeah. Um, we did it with Invesco. And at the time it was the highest return multifamily deal they had done. Right. Right. Um, so that was fun. Um, challenging you know we we messed up in uh minneapolis we got involved with some uh, some friends of ours out of chicago who had a building going under construction 36 stories in uh downtown minneapolis and we put seven million bucks in it and kind of bought it bought into it as it was being uh, built um 
And we, you know, we thought, oh, this, is, this is a no-brainer. We actually brought in another institutional partners of ours to buy a, buy us all out at a huge profit, like a 5x return. And our partner said, no, we should wait till it's finished, which we did. Um, but I missed it in our underwriting. There was an LP in there that couldn't get paid off for five years. And the Pac-Man of the LP kind of ate up all of our profits. Oh, really? So we kind of worked for free. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that one wasn't too much fun. And then what about the most, like, you said three. You said three. you had three. The third one is um, at the last crash, we bought from a, a big private equity firm downtown Chicago. We bought a site uh, for, for next to nothing. And um, Roy did the Miracle Mile. And we built a 57-story building, um, basically, at an eight return on cost. And we still own it. We don't, as you know, we don't hold much. We held right. under that. We were looking right. at the numbers yesterday. So I think we had, um, you know, six million dollars of free cash flow off of the building ah. uh, this this past year. But it's just, uh, it's arguably the best building in the Midwest U.S. Yeah, and it's just a credible. Yeah, it's, a, it's sort of a trophy, trophy type. Of, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. That, that was those one. are the ones you tend yeah. to hold yeah. on to, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, well, cool. What? Um, so you know, we talked about sort of what's going on in the market and, you know, obviously your background. Um, what do you think, I mean, other than the immediate future, like of just, you know, sort of opportunistic and rescue type capital, like what do you think the multifamily market looks like in, you know, five years for a developer? Are we, you know, are, what do construction costs look like? Are they going to come, are they going to, like, what, what does it look like now? What are we trading Deal, what are we trading Class A assets for in five years, seven years, ten years? And, and since we're in Florida, let's talk, you yeah. know, specifically like you know Tampa, Orlando, yeah. Jacksonville, sort of the markets that yeah. we were in. Well, I think I do think Florida is is it a beautiful sort of bubble compared to the rest of the country. Yeah. Right? We so if you think about Florida for a second, in the last twenty months, we've had nine hundred and fifty five thousand people move to Florida. Yeah, from mostly higher income states. Sure generally blue states. And, you know, they found freedom, right? Taxes are lower. You know, there's less traffic. They talked really about low. our friend in Tallahassee. Yeah. Doing a great job, right? Yeah, yeah. Done a great job, yeah. right? <laughs> and so, um, you know, so if you think about it, 955,000 people, and that's kind of a common statistic. Here's one you, you may not be familiar with. If you go deep into the data and you look at the IRS information of those people, the average income is 200000 Yeah, you mentioned this to me at lunch yeah. when we were at it's lunch. Staggering. Yeah, it it's is, staggering. It's amazing. Number. So if you do the math, that group of people, those 955 at 200000 that's $25 billion annually right. of economic impact to the state of Florida. Yeah. Think about that. Yeah. The next closest state is Texas, and it's only $5 because their incomes are lower because of the border, right? Right. Like people coming across the border – Make sure or nothing. So sure. excuse the number. Yeah. Right? But you look at that number. So that's just last 20 months. That right. Economic engine for the state. So I think, um, you know, it's it's hard to be. Well, and a lot of them are bringing jobs. Yes. I mean, that's, they're not just bringing themselves. They're not bringing money. They're bringing yeah. jobs. Yeah. You look right. At, they're bringing their companies. They're bringing their companies. You look yeah. At, Ken, oh, what's the Ken, edge? Ken Griffin from Ken Sarah Griffin and, and Kathy Wood. Yeah. They, they're bringing hundreds of Ken's, I think, bringing 3,000 people. Right? Yeah. They're and these are not, income. yeah, these they're are hundred thousand dollar yeah. plus jobs. And so, you know, you've got, you know, it's really an, an, a, an enormous economic engine. Right? Yeah. Um, the other thing is, is that, as you know, you know, I've talked about this off, off and on for a couple years. Like <clears throat> if you get a call from out of town and a developer says, Hey, I'm going to come in town next week. Show me five sites in Tampa, th uh, three story garden deals that I can buy. You say stay home, like yeah, right. I, I don't have them. Right? Right. They, they don't exist, right. right? And so, so the other weird thing is because you, you know, if you get an airplane, like there's land everywhere, right? Right. But <clears throat> there, there's really not that much entitled land um, that makes a lot of sense. N not near employment centers. Not near employment centers. Not yeah, where the markets out, yeah. justify. Justify. Right. Well, and, yeah. and you, you touched on a little bit ago. The construction costs are so elevated. Yeah. That you can't go out there where the land's a little cheaper and yeah. you can't, you can't make the math work. Right. So take Lakeland for an mm -hmm. example, like, you know, Lakeland, Winter Haven. Yeah. I mean, for a long time, it was, you couldn't, I mean, you, you love the market, there's yeah. jobs, it's, it's ripe for growth, mm -hmm. but you couldn't really build because the rents just weren't quite right, right there. And then the rents caught up yeah. and then you started to see some supply coming in, but now 
the rents are, you know, sort of flattening or moderating yeah. and the construction costs are up. So now, you know, unless you're Maine and Maine in Lakeland, like, yeah. you know, or Winter Haven, you know, not every deal is going to, going to pencil. Right. Pencil, right? Yeah. yeah. The other problem you have, at least in, in our side of the business where we're building and selling is, I mean, part of our mission, uh, our, 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 our model is we we're building an institutional product for an institutional buyer because we're building and selling. Sure. And so not that there aren't institutional, institutional buyers in Winter Haven, but, you know, if there's five, you know, there's 55 in Tampa, right? right? So there's a little bit of price disparity there. And I think it gets exaggerated when you're in a tertiary market. Yeah. It gets exaggerated. Yeah. So, so if a garden deal in Tampa MSA today is worth 240, 250, is it worth 210, 220 in Winter Haven? Probably, right? right? There's, a, right. there's a big gap there. Right. And so that's somewhat problematic, at least for our side of the business. We sure. like those markets, yeah. you know, as uh, fundamentally. But I think I you got to be willing to hold them. Yeah, you got to be a holder. Right? I mean, yeah. that's the thing is you yeah. got to be willing to build it and hold it. Yeah, and that's sort of, you know, I, I mentioned to you, we're, we're, we're selling a decent amount of land. And I think, you know, most of the buyers are people who are, you know, either business plan or have the capability Mm-hmm. to to keep it on the balance sheet for right. a period of time. You know, the merchant guys are, you know, scribbling out the math and saying, yeah, we can't, can't, we can't, we can't, yeah. you can't do it. Not right now. We need, you know, something. It's not enough margin. Yeah. Exactly. Something to tip. And so, um, you know, and, and there's been, I mean, but as much supply has come in, there's been, you know, it's all getting absorbed in, in, in Florida, especially mm-hmm. in major markets because of what you just talked about. Yeah. So the, the people still want to build. They're just trying to figure out, you know, everybody still wants to be here. Yeah. They're just trying to figure out how. It's a hard puzzle to solve right now. Yeah, it is. <clears throat> it is. And then when the land prices were going, you it know, out. through the roof, you know, now how many of those actually are going to end up closing at those? If they haven't yet, they're not going they're to. They're not going to be doing it. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. And, you know, it's if you put a if you put a site, a development site under contract, you know, last summer. You're probably or, or before it's probably been retraded once or twice by now, if not dropped once or twice by now. And and we've had. Yeah, we've had that. We had a site in Deltona right next to the hospital. Great site. Merchant builder got through, you know, up until like a week of left of diligence and then they dropped it. Well, who stepped in? Somebody who can hold it for five, you know, five, 10 years after they build it and they ended up closing it. So there's a lot of deals floating around Florida where plans and specs are done and. The guy's bailing out. Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. The math yeah, we're, we're seeing some of that as well. You know, so I mean, like for us, like, you know, that's, that's a, actually, we've, we've sort of seen a, a little bit of that uh, more recently. And I'm wondering, like, how do we, you know, turn that into a little mini business to get us through the time when, um, you know, when, yeah, when the apartment sales are coming. So, you know, we're talking to developers all the time because we do so much, you know, development work that, you know, the people are telling, you know, the other day we just got a call, like we had a site listed in Palm Bay and we get a call on that deal saying, Hey, I've got a site down the street. I'm not going to build it. Right. And, you know, and the way those things are teed up now, we can close them almost as fast as we can close an apartment complex now. Right. I mean, yeah, 30 and 30. All, all, yeah it's all, all, all the, done. All the third parties are there. Yeah, drop off, plans are there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's everything. It's like, you know, 45, 30 or whatever. And, and, and we're closed, which, you know, in the land, land before. Yeah, right. it was 18 months, two years. Yeah. Right. So, um, so there's always, you know, like we talked about in every market, there's always opportunity. I mean, it, it might not be as fast as furious as some other markets, but there's always opportunity. So, all right. So, you know, you're, you guys are invested pretty much nationwide, right? So outside of Florida and the markets that we've talked about, I mean, if you were talking to a young developer who had the country as a blank canvas, give me a handful of markets where you think there's there's upside and, and an opportunity to to you know grow with the market. You know, this is gonna this is a bit of an oxymoron, but you know, we're in we're deep in Northern California. Okay. Um and and you know, for for all that we missed in downtown Tampa, mm-hmm. um, we've made up in, in some weird places like northern New Jersey and Northern California. And part of our underlying thesis is basis, right? Right. So like right now, we've got three deals in Northern California um, in the pre-development pipeline. We got a couple under construction, but, you know, where we're paying under 25000 a door, the rents are three fifty, 
It costs a little bit more to build, build in California, but not crazy. And I've heard the timeline is is significantly longer to get a shovel in the ground, right? Timeline's longer. Yeah. yeah. And so um, for as much of an exodus that's out of California, going to you know Nevada and primarily Phoenix, um, there's still millions and millions of housing units short in California. Right. And so, you know, we like the basis there. So we, we kind of, we like that market. Um, and we've got some things that are zoned ready to go, right? You're so, not worried about, you know, p- pending like rent regulations or anything like you that. You know, they've been talking about it for 25 years. I think it's going to be hard to pull off. Yeah. You know, if you think about it, if, if you want to shut down the housing market, Put in some rent control. I mean, <laughs> right. I mean it's just because yeah. everybody leaves, right? Yeah. So in right. our, our Chicago deal is, is a great example that, that I was talking that 57 story building. So if you want to shut down a market, you know, Mayor Lightfoot just got booted, you know, from, oh, yeah. from being the mayor. And um, when she got elected four years ago, the f- thing she did on day one is she's a Marxist. She put in a Marxist tax collector. Right. The tax collector doubled the real estate taxes on day two. Take the money, you know, and the thesis was take the money from the rich, give it to the poor. Sure. Okay, I get it. But what you did then is you had a fiat government. So all the institutions that in, that put money out in real estate, debt and equity said, we're not lending in Chicago because yep. what if they do that again next year, right? right. And so on, on our building, just as one example, that cost us $50 million on the building. In value? $50 million in value. Yeah. We were under contract with a foreign buyer at $50 million. Now, we ended up not selling it. We said, we'll just hang on to it. Yeah. But, um, and, and so they, so the mayor and the tax collector devalued all that real estate, number one. And number two, nothing, for our building, it's an yeah. advantage, right? Nothing has gotten built in downtown Chicago in four years because yeah. the institutional said, we're out, right? If, if you hear this all the time. Money goes where it's it's there's no friction, right? Right. When there's friction, governmental friction, yeah, like that's that, a great way to money put it. runs away. Yeah, that's and a great so, way to put it. so now they have a real for all the exodus out of Chicago proper, they have a housing shortage, right? Yeah. Uh, there's not enough housing, so you know we've been raising our rents because you know, we can, right? <laughs> and and so now the the new mayor's like, how do we solve? There's a runoff, but they're both of the candidates are like, how do we solve the housing crisis? Really, don't be a fiat government. <laughs> well, even the mayor of New York said the way to fix affordable housing is to build more units. I mean, he's asked, he's trying, he's saying they need five thousand more units in the city. They probably need more than that. I mean, I don't know where they're going to build them in the city, but um, but I mean, even, even he's saying that, you know, and 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 that's the you know sort of the the home of rent. Uh, rent restrictions, right? Yeah, rent control. So where are we? I don't know. I lost my, I lost my train of thought. We were talking about Northern California. You're in Chicago. Any sort of, you know, boi- so, the Boise's so, of the so, world, markets know, we, like we, that, we, that we're you're- Construction of Boise. We are you? Boise. Okay. Uh, we're in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Right? Okay. Um, and, and so you, you look around, we try to find interesting markets, like I said, we where we can get a basis place. So I'll tell you the story of Santa Fe. Because like, if you look at Santa Fe property, like, that's a tiny little town, resort town, nestled in the mountains. Like it's a beautiful place. When we lived in Arizona, my wife and I would go over there for romantic weekends. It's sure. spectacular. But here's why we're there. Um, if you're familiar with Los Alamos National Labs, that's where the nuclear bomb was. Yeah. Built, right? Yeah. So if you go on the website, they're trying to hire today 4,000 nuclear engineers starting incomes 150. Wow. That's what opened. Right. Yeah. Plus all the ancillary jobs. Right. Yeah. There's no housing. The average house in Santa Fe is nine hundred thousand dollars. There's a water shortage. Right. It's in the desert. Right. Right. So here's a here's a cool thing. If you're a developer. Oh, you told me this stuff. Go ahead. Yeah. And you want to build a an apartment building in our case or a house, you have to go find a rancher that has water rights that will sell you the water rights that you need. For your house, I'm watching Yellowstone. That's just like it that's was in Yellowstone. 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 Right. Yeah. So, so we're building 370 units there. We had to go find a rancher that had I forget how many acre feet of water, and buy it, give it to the city. We don't get to keep it. Right. They put it in there so they can service the building. So you think about a a, a governor to expansion, right? That's it, right? right. And there right. aren't a lot of those guys. We, right. We were just super blessed. Like God just 
dropped out on our left. And the site, I grew up with a guy who, who uh, went to Colorado and, and uh, he, I called him. I said, hey, I need a site in Albuquerque. He goes, you know, he goes, uh, he's a retail guy, not an apartment guy. He goes, I got an apartment site next to the largest hospital in uh, New Mexico. It's in Santa Fe. Here it is. So it was off market. We didn't overpay for it. <laughs> it's just awesome. And then the, and the rents are crazy, you know, for a three-story walk-up deal. Yeah. The hospital. Always built next to a hospital. Oh, yeah. yeah. So the hospital, the president of the hospital heard about our job, you know, gets put in the paper. And uh, he calls. He says, okay, I need to talk to the president. Okay. Yeah. yeah. What, what do you need? He goes. Can I pre-lease 200 units for my people? Right? right, we have no place to live. Right, the government for Los Alamos. Like, can we get some kind of treatment? We need help. I mean, so yeah, you think about it, right? Um, because again, you could kind of throw Santa Fe at a tertiary market. Like a sure, market. yeah. The difference is these are big time sure. in- income jobs. You know? Yeah, but um, anyhow, well, it's so, sort of like Walmart is doing in Bentonville, right? I yeah. mean, they're, like they're building everything because they need it just for their people. They need it for They've their built people. like. Cities there. I, I somebody told me they're they're building the hospitals. Yeah, in Bentonville, That's and right. they're cooper and they're basically they brought in a, a hospital operator mm-hmm. to run you know to run the hospitals. Yeah. But yeah. it's it's they need they need healthcare, they need shopping, they need schools. They started with the schools. Yeah, they started yeah. with the schools. They have an incredible school district there. Yeah, and then um, the Walmart Fortune. They have a thing called the Bridges there, which is their art museum. Oh which yeah, is second only to the Louvre in Paris. Really. In the world. It's spectacular. It's wild. Yeah. So, like Bentonville. In Bentonville, yeah. Yeah. Where do you fly? Is you fly into Bentonville? Fly to Bentonville. Is that, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Commercial airliners will go in. Yeah. 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 Do you have you guys ever done anything out that way? Uh, you know, I've been to Bentonville a zillion times because we used to be a big Walmart developer. So, okay. Yeah. But we haven't built anything there. We've looked a couple times. And yeah. Quite frankly, we should have just got in there. Yeah. And just and built some apartments. Our office and yeah. Just yeah. Built right. a building a year there. Yeah. Uh, right. To be honest with you, but right. we, we didn't. But yeah. Right. But yeah, it's a, it's a cool. It's turned out to be a cool little town. Cool. Um, well, we typically wrap up by doing something called rapid fire, but, Mm -hmm. uh, you've had such a great sort of, uh, interesting career. I I wanted to give you the opportunity to sort of give like blanket advice to young real estate entrepreneurs, developers, brokers, just trying to break in the business who have no money or broke, you know, that kind of stuff and, and how to stick, stick it through, especially starting, and it t- look, it was easy to start three years ago because yeah. everybody was making everybody made money, money, and it didn't yeah. matter really if you were any good or not. You could make money, but now it's, it's you really it's have to work right? for it. Yeah, now it's hard. So I, I would say a few things that I've learned in my career. One, you know, get a relationship with God because um, all through the Bible, and it, it's I've got it in my life. I mentor a ton of people. Uh, I got fourteen millennial CEOs coming to my ranch tomorrow um, to spend the weekend to learn how to hear from God. But you know. For that young person, you know, if you have a relationship with God, you can ask him like you heard me. He gave me a business plan that I got five hundred million dollars for. Um, And then I did it again. I got a billion dollars. You know, so God will give you ideas. And we call it ask him for ideas, imagination and implementation, whether you're. In the podcast business, and yeah. say, it doesn't matter, right? Right. He's, he's God of everything, right? Right. And so whatever you're doing, he'll do that, right? Um, same thing in relationships, right? I was just at breakfast with a young guy, mentoring him on, you know, he's a young guy. He'd like to get married. And, you know, he's like, how do I do that? Oh, well, let me, let me, let me tell you how to do that. How, <laughs> right. Let me tell you things to avoid. How not to do it, right? Yeah, yeah. let me tell you what not to do. Yeah. And let me give you some advice. Uh, and so that the other thing I would say is that um, it's really important to uh, read. So- I consume um, on a typical week 2,000 pages of information about our business. And and when I say our business, it's broad, right? Because <clears throat> obviously capital markets, but a lot of demography, sociology, right. psychology, right? right? Because you've got to understand that consumer, right? Um, we just opened, um, you know, that building in um, – at the Henry in Sanford. That yeah. Thank you from yeah. You know, so I say open it. We're not, we don't even have a CEO. We just turned on our website, you know, and we signed 28 leases, right? Part of it is we're, we're good at getting in the, the head of that consumer of what they want. So we can, you know, we, we're trying to do two things, right? We're trying to increase velocity, maximize rent, and thirdly, maximize stickiness where that person stays they build community, right? Right. If a person in an apartment building makes two friends, their tendency to stay for three years goes up. It doubles. Interesting. So yeah. if, if I can help you create community 
um, you're going to typically stay unless, of course, you get transferred. stuff. But, uh, you know, having community is super important. So uh, what does all that mean for the young person is don't stop educating. Right. I don't care if you've got a Harvard MBA or whatever. Right. Right. You got to read. You got to study. And then I try to read a book a week. Right. And a lot of it's a brain candy. You know, I like to read these military novels where these guys right. you know, take a read. Right, 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 right. Um, but I, I read a lot of serious stuff. But, you know, sometimes right, right, right left, right, right. You got to be creative. And, and what I found is all that information, God's just mixing it all up. And then when I need it, boom, they'll just give me yeah, it. It's like, just boom, a, yeah, it's just, yeah. Boom, 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 right? And so stay, you know, if there's something you don't know, the good thing now with podcasts like what you're doing and, and there's so many ways to learn yeah. where you don't have to go to university. That's right. Yeah. Uh, I'm not anti-university, but it's hard, right? Right. You know, we have a friend, um, Carlos, who learned to this concept of abiding and walking with God. <clears throat> His mother from Mexico City was pregnant, walked from Mexico City to Phoenix, Arizona. As wow. As a woman through the border, cartels, all that stuff. Has him. No dad, obviously. He grow, grows up. He's washing cars, doesn't go to school, learns what I'm telling you, and he starts flipping houses. <clears throat> well, and God gave him a plan. So there's sort of a house flipping like I was doing. And then he gave Carlos like processes. And then Carlos wrote them out. Now, Carlos makes five, six million dollars a year selling that system and, and hosting. I've been a speaker at some of his events. He, you know, he had one in Scottsdale recently, 2,000 people at a luxury resort. <clears throat> and to go to this weekend, like $2,000 without the room. I mean, right. just a 10 right. conference, right? right. Um, and so I was asking these, these young people, like, hey, uh, I love Carlos, you know, but is it worth it? And, and it was fascinating because, yeah, I make 300000 I make 200000 I make this, I make four hundred. I own 50 homes. I mean, and you see the life change because – there's lots of ways to get education, right, right. without going to university. I'm, That's yeah, right. I'm not anti-university, but depending on what you want to do, right? If, if you're going to do brain surgery, you need to go to university. But, you know, a lot of a lot of what we do, you don't have to have that. And there's a quicker, faster way to get education. I get so much education every day mm -hmm. because what, what do I do for a living? I am on talk? the phone and meeting with people like you yeah. all day long. Yeah. And I've been I've been doing it for, you know, 10, 11 years now. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I've gotten a master class in like yeah. real estate right. investing and development just by, you know, being a broker who picks up the phone and goes to lunches and yeah. goes to meetings and, and, and exactly. stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. Just explore, talk. And, yeah. And never, never stop learning. You yeah. Know? I'm 65. You know, I'm, I'm full bore. I'm in. I'm learning. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. So um, it's like you were looking at my rapid fire questions because the first one is actually – What's the best book you've ever read that really impacted you? You know, the you can't say one. the Bible. So then, because I know the you answer know that, is going to be yeah. the Bible. It so is then, the Bible. It's so not, how about one business wow. related? You know what? There's so many. I, I get asked that a lot. I should probably like pick one, but I, you know, I've got a huge library and, and I read a lot of books over and over. And I'm, I'm okay. It's, it's amazing how much, you know, um, uh, you know, one that's just popped into my mind, I wouldn't actually not necessarily say it's, it's my favorite, but the Black Swan, which is the whole concept of a Black Swan, right? These, right. these events, like the one that wiped me out that I mentioned a little while ago. Right. It took me five years to recover from. But, you know, I think that uh, one of the things that's missing um, in, in young people today, two important things. One is there's risk, especially if you're on the development side, right. less so in the brokerage side. But, you know, there's risk in the development business, high risk, right? Because right? you're usually leverage, and with leverage, it can be positive or negative, right? right. And uh, at the moment, it's very negative for a lot of people, and it's going to get very, very bad over the next year and a half. Right. Um, the other is a sense of history, right? And right. so history is really important. Like this is, like I said, you know, when I started in the business, prime was 18%, right? right? So- I don't like 8%, you know, I don't like 450 over SOFR, you know, right. eight and a half percent right. interest rates, right. but hey, it's still 10% less than when I started. Right. right. So, exactly. You know, so you had to kind of look at, if you have a historical perspective, now, if you're young, your history is short, right? If you're just in the business or, you know, even, even being in it 10, 11 years like you, you know, right. you're still a little short, but, you know, reading, you know, a, a student of history. So I read a lot of history, uh, all types of history, just to see, you know, you can go back to sort of Roman history. And see, wow, what did they do right? What they wrong? Right. And then you can see things that are uh, unfolding in in 
global society, not just in America, but around the world, right? right. You know, I'll, I'll, give you a, I'll give you an interesting example. So, you know, um, the Green New Deal, right? And, and you know, I'm a cons- conservationist and, and having a clean environment is like very important to me, right? right. And I'm a hunter and we, we've got a ranch, so we, we do everything that's sustainable. So very conscious, but, right. and I'm not against electric vehicles, right, at all. Right. Um, don't own one, but I'm not against them. <clears throat> um, but if you look at the at the science, right, there's not <laughs> enough copper, nickel, and lithium yeah. that you need yeah. to have batteries to drive them yeah. in the known resources in the world to get to 50 percent EVs by 2030, which is sort of what the U.S. mandate is and most of the mandate for Western Europe. And so you look at that like it'd be a, it's a delightful idea, right? I'm, I'm not against <laughs> it, but. But we're not going to get there, right? And right. It, and it's not even feasible, right? And so when so what's happening, right? So you have not just our government, European governments pushing that, right? So what's happened in the United States and Western Europe? Energy prices are up five x in the last fifteen months. Energy prices being up five x. Who does that hurt most? That hurts lower and middle income people. That's right. <laughs> it's crushing, right? Right. Um, it's very painful. And so, you know, and again, I look at history because you can see different examples of that I mean, all through 1979, history. 1979. Yeah, not, not, right? The Romans weren't talking about electric vehicles, but but you can look at their what what sort of their Senate did and said, we're going to do this. Like, that doesn't even make sense, right? So, right. so we have to stay educated, right? And, and history is a great educator of the mind to look at and see what trends are, right. you know? So, you know, like on our apartment buildings, you know, if you look at the government, what the government is trying to mandate with 50% EV. So for us in the apartment business, then you would say, I have to put in 50% of my parking spaces better have EV chargers, right? Sure. What does that do to an apartment building to the cost? Well, it, it co- it'll cost you about $3 million, right? Now, that's not a mess. I mean, that, that's going to erode, you know, your profit, your returns, which sure. if it was, if it made sense, we would be doing it, right? Right. Well, what, you, what you're going to do, you're just going to pass it back to the, yeah. to the tenant, yeah. right? Yeah. But, but on the other hand is that we're not going to get there, right? right. So, yeah. so we're not doing it because yeah. we're not getting yeah. into 50%, you know? Right. So, so we're sort of guessing in our mind, are we going to get the 10, 12% somewhere in there <clears throat> and, and see if we can. So we want to accommodate people and we want to do it. But so, you know, I think you have to just be careful of, of a totalitarian type government moves. Sure and understand what that does, right? Sure. So if you think about where we are today with uh, the lack of liquidity and the high interest rates, right? The Federal Reserve overstimulated the economy by dumping $9 trillion in, right? Yeah. Well, you dump $9 trillion into a U.S. economy that's $22 trillion a year, you get inflation, right? Yeah. I, I I did pretty well in economics, but yeah. I'm not an economy. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's pretty simple, right? Yeah. And now they go, hey, we got to fix that. Let's jack up the rates. Well, when you jack up the rates, who do you hurt? The lower income, the middle right. income people. So now your ten dollar gallon of milk is ten dollars plus the the credit card payment, the, yeah. the credit card and the credit card job, too, you know, right? And, yeah. and, and it costs you a ton of money to go yeah. to the grocery store to pick yeah. it up. And it costs Publix, Winn Dixie, wherever you shop. All that stuff comes by truck, right? Yeah. Well, it comes by rail. A lot of it comes by rail first. Those costs are up. Then it gets on a truck. Those costs are up. And so when you start layering in all those costs, you know, you've got fifteen depending on where you are down in Miami, it's, I, I was, I just went to a store the other day down in Miami, $27 for a cart of eggs, $27. Like who, who can afford that? Like it's crazy. Yeah, that's insane. It's nuts, right? And so what makes me upset is, is just government our own and, and certainly in Western Europe where they're just whipsawing the lower income people, you know? And where does all this lead us? I'll, I'll put a bow on it for you and I in the multifamily business, right? Yep. If you look at Europe, <clears throat> on average, some countries are different, but on average in Western Europe, which we like in most of the U.S., 87% of the housing is owned by a corporate entity, not by individuals. Right. It's socialism, right? Yeah. We're headed that way, right? Now we see our friends at Blackstone a little bit in trouble, right? Right. That'll get itself worked out. Sure. But if you look at Blackstone, KKR, the big five, right? Sure. So prior to last, prior to 12 months ago, 
47, just under 48% of all the housing in America on the three years preceding were bought by those big five companies. Think about that. Yeah, that's crazy. That's a socialist model, right? And what happens, it's not because they're going to say, oh, we own it. Let's be generous to the people. (laughs) That ain't happened, right? They're going to own it and they're going to jack up the rates just to where you can pay and have some ramen noodles, right? I mean, they're going to take you right to the edge. It's all an algorithm for them. They have the algorithms already. I've seen them. And so that lack of freedom, you know, alarms me. So that's yeah. why, you know, we're in the housing business, right? We want to provide nice, affordable, fairly priced housing right. so people can enjoy enjoy a life and, right. and have a safe, you know, comfortable place to live. Yeah. Well, this has been fun, man. Uh, very interesting. I'm sure I, I would venture to say one of the one of the best ones we've done just just because of the content we discussed. So really appreciate it. Um, I'm sure we'll have more of these fun conversations offline. But thanks, Ed, for being here. We had a great time. I enjoyed it. Thank you very okay. much. Okay, awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Multifamily Method. If you enjoyed today's episode, please give us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. It helps our podcast get discovered by other savvy investors like yourself. Subscribe to Multifamily Method for free on your podcast platform of choice. Find out more about Capstone Companies at capstone-companies.com. Multifamily Method is executive produced by Capstone Companies. Audio production for the podcast provided by Andy Go of Gojo Studios and video production by Yash Mystery of Mystery Projects. 